Lord, with you at our side, with you for us, who could be against us? We pray, Lord, that we would stand in the confidence of forgiveness in Christ, knowing that his blood was shed for us, that we might stand before you and be made right. We thank you, Lord, that we have been raised to life in Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to take your copy of Scripture and turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And this morning we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 10. 5 through 10. And uh, if you're using one of the Bibles that we provide for you, you'll find our passage on page 942. 942. Last week we did begin a series in Romans chapter 6 through 8, and so last week we looked at the first four verses of chapter 6, and uh, this week we plan to look at uh, verses 5 through 10. So I'm going to begin reading for us in verse 1, and then I'll read through to verse uh, 10, and we will consider what God has to say to us uh, from his word. So Romans chapter 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. I'm going to read verse 11 as well. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, I've entitled our message this morning, In Christ, in Christ. Approximately 80% of adults who live in the state of Georgia claim to be Christian. That's a pretty high percentage. But I do wonder if you were to ask those same adults, 80% of adults in the state of Georgia, if they were in Christ, I wonder how they might respond. I wonder if they might look at you kind of funny, confused, baffled. Maybe alarmed. Maybe they might, they might even think, what do you mean? Are you trying to start a cult or something? Well, Paul wrote much of the New Testament. And in Paul's writings, this is interesting, he never referred to himself or to other believers as Christians. Rather, he constantly spoke of himself and of other believers as being in Christ. In fact, those phrases in Christ or in Him, you can find some 180 times in Paul's writings. Now, it's not to say that the word Christian is bad. It's not bad at all. It's a great word. It's a great way to identify believers. And we find the word Christian actually in the New Testament three times. We find it in the book of Acts twice. We find it in Peter once. A Christian means a follower of Christ, or as C.S. Lewis famously suggested, Christian means to be a little Christ. But to be in Christ is not simply to follow Christ or to imitate Christ. Rather, it is to find our whole self in Him and to find Him in us. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul, his own testimony in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul confesses, 
I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. And the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is a remarkable claim, a unique claim to Christianity. For example, Muslims don't profess to be in Muhammad or in Allah. But Christianity confesses that God has gone so far to redeem us, to save us, to transform us, that he united himself to us in such a way that we are forever changed. Therefore, to be in Christ means that Christ is our substitute. Christ is our representative. So that what is true of him is true of me and will be true of me. That the historical events of Jesus' death and resurrection become personal, transformative realities in our own lives. This, in fact, is so vital for us to understand as Christians that the Apostle Paul in all the various letters that he wrote throughout the New Testament spends much of his time in those letters trying to explain and apply to his readers what it means to be in Christ. John Owen, a Christian theologian from the 17th century, once suggested that a pastor has two primary responsibilities. The first responsibility is evangelistic. That is persuading those who are under the reign of sin that they are in fact enslaved to sin and need a savior. And the second responsibility is pastoral. That is persuading those who have been delivered from the tyranny of sin that they have in fact been delivered from sin, that they are free and they are in Christ. And that, my friend, is what we are going to be considering this morning. What does it mean to be in Christ? And from our text this morning, we will see that to be in Christ means that we are united to him in his death, and we are united with him in his resurrection. And those are our two points this morning. United with Christ in his death, in verses 5 through 7, and united with Christ in his resurrection, in verses 8 through 10. So look there in verses 5 through 7, united with Christ in his death. Paul writes, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, notice in verse 5 that Paul here makes just more of a general statement regarding our union with Christ. Verse 5, for if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. But then his focus turns in verse 6 and 7 to our union with Christ in his death. Okay? So verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for the one who has died has been set free from sin. So the focus turns to our union with Christ in his death. And if we're going to understand what Paul says here in verse 6, we need to give some careful thought to a few of the words that Paul uses here in this verse. Notice he says in verse 6, our old self, and that word translated self is anthropos, it could be translated old man, Our old self, or our old man, was crucified with him. Now, what is our old self? What is our old man? Well, what Paul is referring to here is who we were before our conversion. Or we could say it this way. It's who we were in Adam. Our old sinful self that was blind to the beauty of God, that was indifferent to the grace of God, that was stubbornly opposed to God's will and his ways. And Paul says here in verse 6 that our old self was crucified with Christ, which is actually a more vivid description of death, right? So our old self, our old person was crucified or it was put to death with Christ. 
And why? Notice what he says in the text. In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So, we've considered what the old self is. Now, what is the body of sin? We need to make a clarification here. Paul is not teaching that the body, our physical bodies, are inherently evil. Uh, Some make this mistake. Some assume that the body, that which is physical, is irrelevant at best and evil at worst. And that the soul, or that which is spiritual, is really what is of value and what is good. But that is not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the Apostle Paul teaches. In fact, we see in creation that God created all things. In particular, He created the physical world and He declared it is good. And we see in the incarnation that the Son of God took on flesh, that is, He took on a body, and He dwelt among us. We see in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that when Christ was raised from the dead, He wasn't just raised as a spirit or a bodiless soul, But he was raised and given a new body, a resurrected body, a perfect body that he possesses now and will possess for all eternity. So the body is not inherently evil. However, the body does become the vehicle through which our sinful self expresses itself and acts out in rebellion against God. So next week we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 14, but just skip down for a moment and look at verse 12. And Paul writes there, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. You see, that's the ambition of sin. As it reigns in our lives, it wants to express itself through our physical bodies. Paul says here that the body of sin has been brought to nothing through our union with Christ. Now, Paul declares then in this verse that our old self was crucified and our body of sin has been brought to nothing. Now, we need to make another clarification here because some people reading this verse have then drawn the conclusion that Paul here is teaching some idea of perfectionism. The idea that once we believe and trust in Jesus, it is impossible for the Christian to sin, or that it's possible for the Christian to eventually get to the point where they will sin no more in this life. Now, let me just say, this is a minority position. I think as you look at Christians as a whole, there are not many people who hold this position, but it's still important for us to address One of the reasons it's important for for us to address is that even if you don't officially hold this position, Paul's words here might trouble your conscience. You might wonder, well, if I'm a Christian, based on what Paul says here, why do I still struggle with sin? Is Paul teaching here that it's impossible for the Christian to sin when he says that we're dead to sin? Well, let me just make three quick points from our passage that I believe make it clear that Paul is not suggesting some form of perfectionism. Number one, I would say that Paul is not suggesting some form of perfectionism because of Paul's description of our death to sin. Because of Paul's description of our death to sin. Now, we've already noted in verse 2 that Paul says we died to sin. In verse 6, he says our old self was crucified. He also says that our body of sin has been brought to nothing. The question is, what does Paul mean by that? What does he mean that we've died to sin? What does he mean that our body of sin has been brought to nothing? Well, if we look in the larger context, I think Paul makes it clear. According to chapter 6, verse 1, it means that we will not continue in sin. In chapter 6, verse 2, it means that we will not still live in sin. According to chapter 6, verse 6, the very place where he's speaking about this matter, it means that we will no longer be enslaved to sin. So look there in verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. What do you mean by that, Paul? So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So I believe this is what Paul is getting at. And these 
descriptions here indicate that Paul is not describing perfection, but rather he's describing a freedom from the bondage and dominion of sin. As many people have stated it, it is not freedom from the presence of sin, but it is deliverance from the power of sin. It's not that it's impossible for the Christian to sin, but it is impossible for us to continue in old patterns of sin without repentance and without any change. So Paul describes what he means by this in the context in such a way that makes it clear that he's not talking about perfectionism. He's not talking about the absence of the presence of sin in our lives in this life. But rather he's talking about deliverance from the power of sin. The second reason. Paul's exhortation for us to die to sin. This is the second reason why I don't believe Paul's teaching perfectionism in this passage. Paul's exhortation for us to die to sin. Now, next week, as I said, we're going to look at verses 11 through 14. But just turn there uh, briefly now. Look there in verse 12. Paul says, Let not sin reign, therefore, in your mortal body. And in verse 13, he says, Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God. Now, if it were impossible for the Christian to sin, of course, Paul would not have to offer these admonishments and exhortations, right? If it was impossible for us as Christians to sin, Paul would not be saying, don't present your bodies to sin. He wouldn't be saying, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. In fact, these admonishments and exhortations indicate that, yes, there is a battle. There's a struggle still going on in the Christian's life. And, of course, in chapter 7, Paul will unpack this much more fully. And Paul acknowledges that struggle. The third reason I believe that Paul is not teaching Christian perfectionism in this passage is because of the already not yet understanding that Paul has of salvation. Now, let me say that again because we've never heard that before. That might sound strange. But because of Paul's already not yet understanding of salvation. Now, what do I mean by an already not yet understanding of salvation? Well, many, we see this throughout the Bible and especially in Paul's writings, many of the promises of God's salvation we experience now in the present. And then the Bible tells us we will experience more fully to come. So they're not yet. They are already, we experience them now, and they are not yet. They will come in their fullness in the future when Christ returns. There are many examples of this. But in particular, let's just consider how this relates to our union with Christ in his death. We have died with Christ, the Apostle Paul says. That means that the power of sin has been broken in our lives now, presently. So that as one author has put it, no longer do we have to live as helpless slaves to sin. And it is true that when Christ returns, the presence of sin in our lives now will be finally and fully eradicated. So as the hymn gloriously declares... We will be freed to sin no more. That is the already not yet dynamic of our union with Christ in his death. We are presently, we have been presently delivered from the power of sin. That's now, that's already. And not yet, what is to come is that we will be finally and fully and ultimately delivered from sin. And sin will be altogether eradicated from our lives when Christ returns and we are perfected in him. So for all these reasons, Paul is not talking here about Christian perfectionism, but he is talking about a genuine, true transformation and victory over sin in the Christian's life. Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher from the 19th century he tells a story about meeting a man when he, he was a young guy, and he met a man who claimed to be perfect, who had reached a state of sinless perfection. And he records the encounter. He says, I met in my first pastorate, as I have often done since, a number of persons who professed to be perfect and who said that they had lived so many months or years without sinning against God. One man who told me that he was perfect was humpbacked. 
And when I remarked that I thought if he were a perfect man, he ought to have a perfect body, he became so angry that I said to him, well, my friend, if you are perfect, there are a great many more as near perfection as you are. So, so, so this man is claiming to be perfect, but he, he's, he's got a, some kind of defect, physical defect. And Spurgeon points it out and says, well, if you claim to be perfect, I think you should have a perfect body as well. Well, the guy gets so angry that he kind of lashes out at Spurgeon. Spurgeon says, well, obviously you're not perfect. The man exclaims, oh, I shall feel it for having been betrayed into anger. He said that he had not been angry for many years. I had brought him back to his old state of infirmity. And painful as it might have been for him, I have no doubt that it did him good to see himself as he really was. End of quote. So Spurgeon makes this point to him. He gets angry. Spurgeon points out his anger. And Spurgeon says, although it may have been painful for him, it brought him back to who he really was. He saw that he was, yes, still a sinner. Augustine, the early church father who lived in the 5th century, he stated it this way. Now listen to this. And he's, he's using Latin phrases, but listen to this. This is so helpful. Before Adam fell into sin, Augustine says that Adam was posse picare, that is, able to sin. So Adam's in the garden. Before he fell, he was posse picare, able to sin. After the fall, Adam was non posse, non picare, not able to not sin. In other words, once he fell into sin, he was enslaved to it. He was in bondage to it. He couldn't do anything else. He just sinned consistently, ongoingly. Augustine goes on to say, but those who are believers in the Lord Jesus are posse non picare, able not to sin. The power of sin has been broken in their lives. They no longer have to yield every time sin pulls its chain. And then finally, when Christ returns, we are finally glorified, and then we will be non posse picare, not able to sin. Sin will be finally eradicated, freed to sin no more. The Apostle Paul says we are united to Christ in his death. It is an already not yet reality, but in the present, it does mean that the bondage of sin has been broken in our lives so that we can experience genuine victory in the Christian life. Now, second, we are united with Christ in his resurrection. We are united with Christ in his resurrection. Look there in verses 8 through 10 and we read these words. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Now, again, we see in these verses, and this is so important to Paul's understanding of who we are in Christ, we see this already not yet understanding of our salvation. We've already seen how this principle applies to our union with Christ in his death, but now Paul talks about how this principle applies to our union with Christ in his resurrection. So notice in our text, and we're going to look at more broadly kind of the context here, but notice that Paul speaks both of the hope of our future resurrection in Christ and the present reality of resurrection in our lives now, as we've been united to Christ in his resurrection. So, first of all, the future hope of resurrection. Look there in verse 5. Paul says, For if we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we shall or will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So I take that as a future. Paul's looking forward. He's saying, if we've been united in a death like his, we will, we shall in the future be united with him in a resurrection like his. Or verse 8, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will, we shall in the future also live with him. So this, this union with Christ in his resurrection has a future dynamic to it. It's not yet. It's coming. There is more to come. But there's also a present reality of this resurrection power in our lives. So look at verses 4 and 5 of chapter 6. We were buried, therefore, with Christ by baptism into death, 
in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's now, present tense. We can walk in newness of life, a new way. And then look at verse 11. We'll be looking at this more next week. But in verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That is presently, now, you're alive to God in Christ Jesus by the resurrection power of Jesus. So this resurrection power is a future hope, not yet, and a present reality. It is now. We already experience this life now, and when Christ returns, we will experience it in all its fullness. Now, let's press into this just a little bit deeper. This already not yet dynamic of resurrection power applies both to the eternal life that we have been granted in Jesus and to our relationship with sin. Okay? So, regarding the eternal life that we've been granted in Jesus and our physical bodies, consider this, we presently possess the hope of resurrection, but that hope is not yet finally realized. Although our souls, when we die, will go to be with the Lord, our physical bodies will be laid in a grave. And they will lay there. And they will lay there. And they will lay there. But when Christ returns, our bodies will be raised. They will be resurrected. That's what's to come. They will be raised and resurrected. Our bodies will be united with our souls. And our redemption will be full and complete. So there's this already not yet dynamic. We have this hope of resurrection. When we die, our souls go to be with the Lord. That's already, right, in that moment. But there's a not yet dynamic too. We don't have redeemed, fully redeemed bodies. That's coming when Christ returns and our souls and bodies will be reunited and the resurrection power of Christ in our lives will be fully realized in all its fullness. This already not yet dynamic also applies, this resurrection power already not yet dynamic applies to our relationship with sin. So we have died with Christ and not only have we died with Christ... We have been raised with Christ by His Spirit, as Paul tells us in verses 4 and 5, to walk in newness of life. That means now, presently, our lives, we have a new life. We have a distinct life. We have a transformed life because the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us. But when Christ returns, this is the not yet, when Christ returns, we will only know life. That's all we'll know is life. Just life and life and more life. Perfect life, everlasting life, no sin, only life, forever and always. So this is the already not yet dynamic of resurrection power in our lives as it relates to sin. Victory now, but full and complete life forever when Christ returns. And Paul tells us that there is a permanence to this new life that we have in Christ. Look there in verse 10. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Now this is interesting because in verse 10, now notice this. And I know this is a bit of a technicality, but I... I had never seen this, and in study this last week, reading a number of commentators, seeing this, others point this out. Notice here in verse 10, it says, Christ died to sin. Not Christ died for sin. There's a distinction. Now what we most commonly probably think of is Christ dying for sin. And that is also true. That's the glorious, one of the glorious aspects of the good news of the gospel, right? Christ has died for sin. That is, he has died for our sin in our place as our substitute. When he died on the cross, he took the punishment that we deserve for our sin. And he died in our place so that if we turn from our sins and trust in Jesus, we can be forever forgiven. But that's not what Paul says here. 
Here Paul says Christ died to sin. So what does it mean that Christ died to sin? Well, notice in verse 9 that one of the statements that Paul makes there at the end of verse 9 is that death no longer has dominion over Christ. The assumption is there was a time where death did have, at least in some respect, dominion over Christ. So when the Son of God became man, there is a sense in which he placed himself under the dominion of sin and death. Now we need to be careful here. We need to be clear. He never sinned himself. He never submitted himself to sin in any way in that sense. He was perfect. But by virtue of entering into this world, he entered into the realm of sin. And the implications of all of that he took upon himself. So, for example, notice how Paul describes this fallen world that we live in back in chapter 5, verse 17. Paul says in chapter 5, verse 17, because of that one man's trespass, and there he's referring to Adam, because of Adam's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Now, that's a description of our world, isn't it? Sin reigns in our world, and one way that it reigns in our world is that everyone dies. There's no exceptions. Sin ultimately leads to death. Or as Paul says in chapter 5, verse 21, sin reigned in death. And this is the world that the Lord Jesus entered. And at the cross, and and, in entering this world, Jesus, in one sense, he allowed himself to be tempted. He allowed himself to feel the effects and the consequences of sin, the sin of others, and the sin of this fallen, broken, cursed world. And at the cross, Jesus yielded himself to sin's most powerful weapon, death itself. And in so doing, the Apostle Paul says, he died to sin once for all. That is, it's never to be repeated. And by his glorious resurrection from the dead, he defeated sin. He defeated death. Sin no longer has dominion over him. He is dead to sin, and he's dead to the realm of sin, and he will never return to it. He's dead to all that sin represents, including death, and the life he lives now, he lives to God. He will never return to the realm of sin in that way. He will never return to death in that way. He died to sin. And if we are in Christ, we died with him, and we will never return to the realm of sin in the way that we were once in bondage to sin. We will never go back there. It is done. John Stott states it this way. Now listen to this. This is an illustration that John Stott uses. It's really helpful. He says, quote, Imagine an elderly believer called John Jones who's looking back over his long life. It's divided his conversion between two halves to the old self, John Jones before his conversion, and the new self, John Jones after his conversion. By faith and baptism, John Jones was united to Christ. His old self died with Christ to sin, its penalty born and finished. And at the same time, John Jones rose again with Christ, a new man to live a new life unto God. His life is divided into two halves. His biography into two volumes. Volume one ended with the judicial death of his former self. Volume two opened with his resurrection. He must remember these facts about himself. He is to keep reminding himself, volume one has long since closed. I am now living in volume two. It is inconceivable that I should reopen volume one as if my death and resurrection with Christ had never taken place. Stott goes on to say that the Christian For the Christian to contemplate going back to their old lives and their old patterns of sin would be like an adult going back to their childhood, a married person going back to their singleness, a discharged prisoner going back to their prison cell. Christ 
died to sin, was raised, and now lives unto God. And his work is final, it's complete, it's permanent, and if we are in Christ, the same has happened for us. We've been granted a new life, a distinct life, a transformed life, and we cannot go back to the old life. So Paul here describes union with Christ in his death and union with Christ in his resurrection. And I want you to see this. Paul seems to indicate here in Romans chapter 6 that the essential key to sanctification, that is to ongoing progress and growth in the Lord Jesus Christ, is not, as some people may assume, it's not an emotional high It's not a mystical experience. It's not some technique that you've got to master. At the heart, at the core of what it means to continue to grow in Christ and become more like Christ and to grow in holiness is to know. To know who you are in Christ. Notice this in the text. Look at verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Or verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Or verse 9, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Do you see what Paul is saying? Do you know this? Do you not know? Surely we know this. Now, let me just say, as Christians, it may take us some time as we are As we have gone from this old life to this new life, it may take us some time to get a sense, a real grasp of our new identity. We're told that those who struggle deeply with drug addiction, maybe for years and then after a time are able to get clean, it can take them up to 18 months or longer before they view themselves as quote-unquote normal. That is no longer under the control of the addiction. Or you think about someone who overcomes a battle with anorexia. They can go through an extended period of time before they associate, no longer associate themselves with being fat, right? And of course they're not fat, but that's the way they've always, that's their old pattern of thinking. That's the way they always thought about themselves. It takes a long time to break free from that thinking. Or you think about an athlete who suffers a serious sports injury and then he's fully healed. But it takes time for him to feel that he's fully recovered and possess confidence to kind of throw himself entirely into the game again. And it can take some time for our new identity to sink in. And so, as believers, we need to be patient with one another in that regard. And at the same time, you see here that Paul assumes that the Christians in Rome, that they know something of what it means to be in Christ. They know something of their new identity in Christ. Do you not know? In other words, Paul is saying, is this not common knowledge among you? And it makes me wonder, my friends, I wonder how much this is common knowledge in our churches today. I wonder how much of this is common knowledge in our own church here at Crawford Avenue. Is it common knowledge in your own life who you are in Christ? This is so integral to who we are, to how we identify, to how we think about ourselves. It's almost like if someone were to ask you your name, or someone were to ask you your phone number or your street address, and it just rolls off your lips without you even thinking about it. I grew up in the same house all my life until I went off to college. My parents still live at that house. I went back this week several times to my parents' house to visit them. 209 Threadneedle Road. Don't publish that. Don't prank them. But that's where they live. On my deathbed, 
If somebody asked me where you grew up, it'd just roll off my tongue. I wouldn't even think about it. Just know it. That's what Paul is saying about our new identity with Christ. Do you not know? This is your new name. You are in Christ. This is your new phone number. If someone wants to reach you, this is where they will find you. This is your new street address. It's where you live. It's where you reside. It is who you are. You are in Christ. It's more important than the color of your hair or your eyes. It's more important than how tall you are or how short you are. It's more important than who your friends are or what family you came from. It's more important than where you grew up or where you work or how much money you make. You are in Christ. That is who you are. Do you not know? Do you not know who you are? You have died with him and been raised with him. And going back to our question last week, can you continue in sin? Unthinkable. I'm in Christ. Listen to how Dane Ortland speaks of our union in Christ, union with Christ in his book entitled Union. He writes, quote, The might of heaven, the power that flung galaxies into existence has swept you into himself. And you're there to stay. Amid the storms of your little existence, the sins and the sufferings, the failure and the faltering, the waywardness and the wandering, He is going to walk you right into heaven. He is not just with you. He is in you. And you in Him. Draw strength from your oneness with Jesus. You are no longer alone, no longer isolated. When you sin, don't give up. Let Him pick you up and put you on your feet again and with fresh dignity. He lifts your chin, looks you in the eye, and defines your existence. You in me, and I in you. So we close. Let me just give you one more illustration of someone who captured this sense of what it means to be in Christ, and it changed and transformed him. I mentioned earlier the early church father, Augustine, who lived in the 4th and 5th century His theological writings have had a tremendous impact on the history of the church. Before his conversion, Augustine was no saint. In fact, he indulged himself in a life of promiscuity and sexual immorality. And there's a story that one day after his conversion, he came across one of the many women with whom he used to commit sexual immorality. And the woman was trying to seduce him to come into her home as he had done so many times before. But Augustine kept walking, kept walking by. And she thought that maybe he didn't recognize who she was. And so she began to call out to him, Augustine, it is I! Augustine, it is I! And Augustine turned around and looked at her and said, Yes, but it is no longer I. He was a new man. He was in Christ. And he could not go back. Do you know, my friends, who you are? It is absolutely essential to our Christian lives and to our maturity in Christ that we know who we are in him. We have died with him. The power of sin has been broken in our lives and we have been granted the Spirit of God to walk in newness of life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for the great hope that we have in the gospel, the great hope that we have in Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would press this reality deep into our own minds and hearts. That we would no longer associate ourselves with the old self, with the old man. We would no longer give our bodies over to be reigned by sin. Lord, we pray that as we trust in the Lord Jesus and as we believe and hope in his death and resurrection, that we would be changed, that we would be transformed. And Lord, help us to walk with 
joy, with confidence, with faith in newness of life. Lord, we thank you for the great hope that we have in Jesus. Take your word now and apply it to our hearts. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. If we have died with Christ, then we will live with Christ. Let's stand and sing of the day when death was arrested. Darkness rejoices though heaven had love. 
Amen, church. Let's be seated for a moment of silent prayer before we part ways. Lord, hear the prayers of your saints and be magnified, we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, please stand for the benediction. Hebrews 13, 20 through 21. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of his eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.